Konnichiwa, Linus Tech Tips viewers. We are coming to you live from Japan. Not live. Not live. In fact, by the time you're watching this, I'll not only have come back from Japan, but also traveled somewhere else and probably be back from there too. So, not live, but definitely from Japan. I can prove it. Look, that's Japan. And we're wearing these robes, so clearly we're not lying. And today we did something pretty exciting, courtesy of Logitech. We got to tour the Omron factory right here in Japan, where they make the Romer G switches in Logitech's G910 Orion Spark keyboard. And it was actually a lot more interesting than I thought it would be. It was kind of awesome. Stay tuned. So the tour kind of began in the lobby, and what I didn't actually know when we showed up was that Omron actually makes a ton of different types of switches. So automotive, factory automation, and then kind of what we're mainly interested in, the more consumer side of things. I thought they just made like mouse switches. And, and not even then, they have a whole bunch of different categories for the types of switches that they have with these little delightful characters. So they have rocker, tactile, miniature, special, sub-mini, and ultra-mini. And they all have their own little, like, superhero... I think Rocker's the cutest one. Ro well, probably. She kind of looks like a pirate. Except I think that's just supposed to be an eye. Yes. Yeah. Well. So, not really pirate. But either way, they're, they're supposed to be superhero characters, and I, I think that's actually pretty awesome. So next up, actually right next to the lobby, was yeah. the labs, which we creatively called Lab 1. And Lab 2. Lab 2. It's amazing. Uh, so lab one, we didn't look at too much. That's where they do uh, Rojas, which is like basically keeping hazardous stuff out of the products, apparently very important. Uh, validation as well as new material development. And then lab two, which was where all the super crazy bananas stuff that we somewhat recognized was, and was the only one that actually had anyone in it today. Although it was one person sitting at the scanning electron microscope looking at one thing. So apparently nothing failed that day. No. They have a ton of crazy expensive machinery in here, including multiple electron microscopes, like yeah. you just said, x-ray machines, all this kind of stuff. One of them was 50 million yen, another one was 10 million yen, and the total cost of that whole lab, just lab two, was 15 million US dollars. Just in case. <sighs> Just in case something dies and you need to know... Exactly like, why. Down to the tiny, tiny sub-microscopic scale. The $15 million just in case lab. So then we had the meeting <laughs> where everyone introduced themselves twice. Twice, yeah. Very yeah. formal, very yes. formal. We watched a video. It was an excellent video. And ensures products of consistent quality. Other products for factory automation and industrial applications represent approximately... Good video, Omron. Very good video, Omron. Yes. Next time you want to make a video... Come talk to us. Come talk to us first. We can help you out a little bit. We'll sort that out for you guys. And then it was finally time to get suited up. I think the best part of this for me was A, that they even had... Yes, official Omron branded like kimonos. And then the second best part for me was when Luke tried to put on the one size fits all <laughs> for Japanese people slippers before that, we went into the lab. That didn't really work out. Also, my kimono was really short. Priceless. <laughs> Flood kimono. Just in case there's a tsunami, <laughs> you're ready for it. I'm... Oh... Okay. <laughs> we're going there. <laughs> wow. Once we were inside the factory, I was actually blown away by how loud it was. There was yeah. a lot going on so in there. So much stuff happening. All the machines are running. Like, some factories you'll enter and it's like, oh, they're only running two or three lines right now. It's like, nope, Omron is 100% all the time. <laughs> it's crazy. So we made our way to the very first step in the manufacture yeah. of a Romer G switch, where they had like a, a metal, big metal spool feeding into a machine. Um, that would then split it in two and then punch out the like main design. Yeah, and then from there, it actually goes on to a new reel that then gets carried somewhere else in the factory. So that's like some cutting edge technology, reel to reel. That's a joke. <laughs> So the next station is where things actually got pretty interesting and I started learning things I did not know about yes. Romer G switches. So there's a couple machines here and at the first sort of functional station in the first one, it basically places a little like super tiny wire. The second station actually checks to make sure that it's there 
That's probably a good thing. The third one forms it and tries to get it within tolerances. And then the fourth one checks again, but with imagery to make sure that it's exactly all laid out how it should be. And then there's a second machine. And that entire machine's job is to put another entire set of these contact points on, which is something I didn't realize about Romer G switches. All switches will have a contact point, but like we just said, there's two sets on this one. So if you happen to get dust or some other type of material on one of the contact points causing it to fail, the other one could still work and you wouldn't even notice that there's anything wrong with your keyboard. So there's a redundant actual, actual actuation. Which brought up switch. a few things that you were pointing out, which is the differences between Japanese manufacturing and German manufacturing. Yeah, because we've seen a few factories now, two German ones and one Japanese, and there's no doubt that the Germans and the Japanese are the most likely of anyone in the world to let us see their factory yeah. because they're clean, yeah. they're efficient, yep. they're organized. And they're world renowned for being great manufacturers. But we noticed a fundamentally different philosophy. The Germans on the one hand are like kind of... Measure 50 times, make sure it's absolutely perfect, cut once. Yeah, and you look at the Cherry MX switch, there's only one point of failure, but the things don't die. Yeah. Whereas the Romer G switch in Omron, I mean, maybe, and maybe they do, but maybe they kind of accept that one of those contact points could fail. Possibly. Possibly it could, but hey, if it does, well, there's two. So we so built that redundancy good. in for you. And another thing I learned about Romer G's at this station is this is a freaking expensive switch. Yeah. The amount of metal in that thing, unreal. Another real joke. But when they led us into a completely different building for the next thing, that's when we knew it was getting real. That's another real joke. Oh. Okay, anyways, the first station, it, it folds those contacts that we were just working with downwards, cleans them up a little bit. And, and I was see, fascinated by that. Yeah, you were. And then we saw the most innovative human machine I've ever seen. Ever. I yeah. didn't realize that every Romer G switch is literally made by people standing next to each other, moving them along the production line until they're finally blown into the little trays yep. for delivery to Logitech by yours truly. Bet you didn't know that either. Actually, that's a bad joke too. There's a real machine behind all the people. That... Yeah, every Romer G switch does not come with some Linus DNA. And You're fine. this is legitimately the coolest piece of manufacturing equipment I have yet seen. This thing is balls to the walls bananas and there's two full lineups of them. So station number one of this monster takes all that metal from before that frankly I was wondering how they get all that in a single. Yeah I was pretty worried about that. Uh, so takes all that before, cuts it, and then positions the folded cut pieces vertically. A real space saver. Next up those pieces aren't actually aligned properly so it turns it and then kind of mushes them together for that awesome redundancy that these switches have. Next that whole thing gets picked up and then placed into the housing that is fed via a hopper system from the back with like vibration feeding and then like an automated orientation checking thing that's actually pretty cool. Pretty ridiculous. Next up was lubrication. So there's actually <laughs> the lubrication station. There's actually three different lubrication drops. You are the lubrication station. <laughs> and that is where it gets a lot of its 70 million key press validation from is the, this lubrication will last that entire time. So after a quick QC stage, not the final one by any means at all, we get to see the little rod that aids light transmission added to the switch. So what's so special about the Romer G is that the LED actually shines up from the middle through this uh, light dispersing rod and then evenly illuminates the entire top of the key switch. A big advantage over other mechanical key switches in the market, which are only able to effectively illuminate about half of the switch, making them a little less, uh, a little less even looking, for lack of a better word. Next up is where we get a lot of the feel of the switch from. So at first we add the spring, which just kind of gets placed there, and then immediately afterwards they have the two blue and white pieces fed from hoppers in the back, and then placed together kind of behind the main assembly line. And then those two pieces go on top of the spring, compressing it all the way down, and the blue piece is just kind of the top uh, housing of the switch. Then the white piece is actually a large plunger. This is again where you get a lot of the feel from of a Romer G. 
after the top and bottom housing are clamped together, it's time for the final QC check. The switch is pretty much done. So it's grabbed and then it moves through a number of stations. So at the first one, it's uh, warmed up, if you know what I mean. And at the second one, it goes through an electronic validation of how the switch press feels to an electronic arm. Then it goes into a like a laser engraving slash photo validation chamber. And if it passes the validation, it gets a laser etching on the side of the part number and the manufacturing date where it is finally taken off the QC carousel, dropped onto uh, an assembly line belt and then blasted, actually it's awesome, I love the little air blast, yeah. blasted by air into the correct tray inside one of the bins for eventual delivery to Logitech. What a cool, cool piece of machinery. Definitely one of the best automated assembly lines I've ever seen. We haven't seen that many. That's true. For those of you wondering, what happens to those switches that didn't make it to the conveyor belt of epic, awesome win? Well, they are validated as failed and then pulled off the line immediately and sorted by why they failed. So that if there's a main reason why a whole bunch of switches are failing, they'll know exactly what's going on. And they can take those back to the lab. They also don't get a laser engraving at all. So if your keyboard, for some reason, had no laser markings on the bottom, it's made out of failed switches that someone somehow managed to obtain from a dumpster behind Omron, and you should probably get that checked out. Yeah. Speaking of checking out, we're checking out, and so uh, the only folks left to talk to you are actually some pretty important guys that we met here from both Logitech and Omron, who want to talk about a little bit more behind the scenes. What exactly got into their heads when they went, Oh yeah, well, let's just take gaming mechanical key switches and completely reinvent them. Which I actually discussed quite deeply with one of them while naked in a hot spring. Did you really? I did. That's hot. It is. It was. <laughs> so Logitech was looking at the market and we saw that there wasn't a mechanical switch that was built specifically for a gaming application. Uh, Omron is well known throughout the world uh, for building mechanical switches, so that seemed like a natural partner to build a gaming switch from the ground up. The, uh, this project took us about the two and two and a half or three years to finish. The objective though for building the Romaji switches is for live longer, move faster, and much brighter than the one we have today. The actuation distance went to 1.5 uh, millimeters instead of two. It gives you an advantage within the context of a game to do your action much more quickly than your opponent. We increased the durability by 40% over a standard mechanical switch that's out on the market today, up to 70 million activations. And in regards to reliability, there are two activation points. So as you're pushing down, even if one fouls, the other one will continue the activation. So there's no risk of a, a lost action in a gaming environment. Logitech 